our next session, we have um, Nabras and Annika, and they'll be talking a little bit about um, how to become an education advocate. And so I'm really pleased to announce um, that they will both be joining us. They are both um, incredible role models of mine, and I've gotten to know them quite recently, but I think that they're going to share um, and inspire all of you. So I'm really excited to announce them. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Anika Mansour. I'm the executive director of the Youth Activism Project. We're a nonprofit that supports teen involvement in policy advocacy and community organizing to take action on issues that impact them the most. And I'm so excited to join Nebras today. Um, she's an education activist and um, she's from northern Iraq and has an incredible story. So I'll go ahead and let Nebras maybe talk about herself, how she became an education activist. And I can also share after that um, a little bit about my background in girls education as well. All right. Thank you, Annika, for having me. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in a very uh, small village in northern Iraq, about 500 people. Um, and in that village, basically life routines were the same for centuries, where boys received the basic education and girls took care of the family. Um, so in that village, um, girls were not allowed to go to school um, just because uh, they thought that girls belong in the kitchen and they should do household chores and instead of going to school. So basically, they did not see a future for that. Um, I grew up and I went, uh, my family's been very supportive of education. Both were denied the right to education at an early age. My mom was able to finish second grade only. And my father uh, was forced to drop out of school because um, his father needed uh, assistance on the farm. So both of them were denied the access to education. And therefore, they've been always, uh, education has been very important in my family. Therefore, they were so supportive. Uh, so in that village, basically, once a girl reaches um, 12 to 15 years old, um, she's usually um, married uh, because com child marriage is a very common norm uh, in that village specifically. Um, so it wasn't easy for me to go to school, attend school in my village. Uh, but because of my family, uh, their support, I was able to attend school. And in 2014, um, I'm a, from a minority religion uh, called Yazidis. So in 2014, uh, ISIS launched a, a genocide campaign against Yazidis. Uh, so me and my village, my village and people in there, we had to flee out of the village because ISIS was advancing. Um, so in there, we became a refugee. Me and my family moved out to another city uh, further north. And uh, I tried to enroll in school in there, but they wouldn't accept me without having a transcript. Uh, so me and my father had to go back to our old village where ISIS was only two miles away um, to get the transcript from the principal. Um, and that day we risked our lives uh, just because I wanted to further my education. I didn't want my statue going a refugee stopping me. I didn't want ISIS stopping me from furthering my education. Um, so in 2004, uh, 2015, uh, we came to the U.S. and when I first landed in here, I spoke zero English. Um, and th from there, I started going to school, attending uh, attending clubs and basically experiencing the American life, having freedom um, to kind of join anything that I want. Um, so that was an amazing opportunity. And right now I study at Creighton. Um, I'm a international relations and economic major and uh, a advocate for uh, girls education. Wow, um, thank you so much Nebras for sharing your story. I mean, it is just simply incredible and very moving to um, how you've been able to overcome so many obstacles to, to receiving your education. So my uh, connection to girls education, it comes from more of a place of privilege. I grew up mm -hmm. in the United States and my family is actually originally from Bangladesh. I was born mm -hmm. in Bangladesh and moved um, to the U.S. when I was two. And so for all intents and purposes, I had a pretty American um, lifestyle with the, as you said, the privileges um, mm -hmm. that come with growing up in America, right? And so um, I, uh, and then when I was eight, I, I visited Bangladesh for the first time since my birth. And I was really excited for that trip. And I remember... Um, landing and just being in absolute shock at seeing, you know, just the widespread destitution and and abject poverty that greeted me when I when I came when I landed in Dhaka, which is the capital and also where my family's from. And so, 
Um, and, you know, I remember um, being so shocked when I went to my grandmother's house and be- I became friends with her with her maid who was only 14 <laughs> years old. She was six years older than me. And I really saw her as, you know, a friend rather than my maid. But it was mm-hmm. that kind of cogn- cognitive dissidence. Like, you know, this, this girl can't go to school. And I didn't think of it in those terms um, until about four years later when um, I got a call from a friend of mine um, to join a community dialogue talking about girls' education. And she had mentioned how Bangladesh is one of the countries, this was back in 2005. Um, now Bangladesh has made a lot of strides in girls' education, but in 2005, they were um, really lagging. And so I remember thinking about my experiences when I'd visited and, and my friend Vanessa and how she wasn't probably able to go to school. So I, I thought, yeah, I'd love to go to this community dialogue which was held by Wendy Lesko, who's a a DC area activist and um, incredible advocate for for, um, elevating the voices of young people. And she was telling us all the statistics, um, you know, 100 million girls around the world are denied education, as you were saying, simply because they're girls. You know, if Mm -hmm. families do have the opportunity to send their child to school, they send the boy. And there's a lot of research that says, actually, you want to consider sending the girl um, because there are, you know, sending a girl to school is is great for they. She educates her children. She increases wages for her community. I mean, there are all these benefits. Um, yet people didn't, you know, people didn't know that. So, um, so I remember being very, um, you know, very, very awed by these statistics. But, you know, I think what's critical is that if there, if that meeting hadn't ended with an invitation to continue um, doing something about the issue, I, um, you know, I'm sad to say I might have just gone back to my house and continued being a 12 year old girl and um, not really engaging in this kind of advocacy, because as a young person, you know, my first thought if would have been, you know, well, what, what can I, what can I do? I don't really, I can't do anything. I'm just a child, right? And growing up as a Bangladeshi American, as a Muslim American, where we're, um, you know, a significant minority in this country, I often felt invisible. So I didn't really think my voice mattered. But that, that um, event actually did end with a call to action. And, um, and it was a moment where, where the, I could, I still remember exactly how, um, Wendy asked the question. She asked me and my friends if we wanted to be architects of of a movement to address this injustice. And I remember thinking, wow, like, I don't think I've ever been talked like that with an adult, you know, as if I were an equal. And so, um, so I jumped at the opportunity. And with my friends, I co-founded School Girls Unite, which is an advocacy organization that um, uh, uh, engages in philanthropy. So we had a scholarship program in Mali, Africa, where we sent, um, where we fundraised for girl scholarships, and we also engaged in political advocacy. So we would lobby our members of Congress. Um, and in 2008, in fact, we actually um, increased the foreign aid budget by $200 million for education through our advocacy. So girls' education is very, very near and dear to my heart. It's, it's what got me started with um, uh, with activism and education advocacy. And now, um, you know, I've Uh, gone back to the Youth Activism Project, which is the organization that I helped start um, for this um, for this initiative. Mm -hmm. And um, and now what we're doing is we're helping students um, take action on issues, not just related to girls education, but but any issue that they're that they're passionate about. So. um, So, yeah, um, on that note, um, I guess a good transition would be um, to talk about, you know, why youth activism is so important um, in this day and age. So I'll let you answer that. Yeah. Um. So to me, I had no idea what youth activism even means. Um. I'm gonna be hundred percent honest. I mean, in that village, we basically had no idea another word existed out of that village. We're just like so small, so isolated. So I had no idea about any of that. Like you said, I saw so many injustices. It's just that I knew they were wrong, but I just couldn't do anything about it. I had no idea what to do about it. Even in the village, um, I witnessed a child marriage with one of my best friends and. I couldn't do anything about it. I just had no idea what to do with it. So when I first got here, I mean, English was a very obstacle for me. Um, I had no idea how to speak any English. So it was just in the beginning, trying to get that language, um, but trying to basically see what like American freedom is about. Uh, I wanted to see what I'm able to do here. So that's why after I finished um, 
uh, high school basically just got to me. I am at a point where I can help others. I experienced the first hand the uh, girls, the struggles goes through around the world, not just in my community, um, to witnessing child marriage, poverty, refugee, being disabled, all of those issues. Um, so that's why I kind of just said it's, it's time kind of to just get up and be a voice, even though the change it's minimum. I mean, I like I noticed that there's no specific platform to make a change. Um, just starting talking about it. I think that's where it started um, with families and my in my area and my community specifically. Um, an NGO, it's not that effective. It's just you have to go and talk to people because social norms that needs to be changed that are limiting mm-hmm. girls uh, potential. So that's where we started talking to people, having a conversation, even if it's one to one. It's not big. It's not a big problem. Platform, but it does make a lot of changes. And the importance of it is that we are a place where we have the privilege. Uh, we are a place where we're fortunate um, to go to school here. We have the resources that we need. We're able to do. We have the freedom uh, to choose whether to be quiet or speak up about it. I think uh, that's a very important like aspect of youth activism is just that anybody could be an activist anybody could be an advocate it doesn't have to be you experience firsthand just learning about it hearing stories from other countries uh, uh girls from other i have heard malala story from the first time it was just amazing that girls i'm not the only one who's going through this there are other million girls who are facing the same thing i think the important of it is just we kind of as young people create a platform whether it's through social media or through all other outlets where we can advocate for the issue, speak up about it. Because right now we're at a point we have a voice. We can be the voice for those who don't have a voice. And I think um, anybody could be an activist at that time just for girls' education. A lot of girls in other countries don't have the freedom we have, don't that have the resources that we have right now in the United States or other countries. So just trying to be the voice for those who are less fortunate. I think that's the most important aspect of youth activism in today's. Yeah, that's beautifully said. I don't know if I can add much to that. Just that, yeah, I want to reiterate how important it is to just go out there, right? If there is some, there's an injustice in the world that really, um, that's really upsetting you, you have the power. You can, um, you know, our organization helps young activists all the time. So you can, you know, check us out at, um, uh, at you act project on all social media or youth activism project.org just doing a shameless plug but that's exactly what our organization does we help young people get started and if you are just even a little bit interested in being an activist please um please come talk to me and and you know i'm happy to happy to guide you through that journey um I want to ask also specifically, um, because I know this is an uh, important Mm -hmm. topic for you, how can we elevate the activism of girls in situations like you were were once in, right? Like, how Mm -hmm. can we elevate their voices? How can we make sure that we're following their lead? Also, because um, having these girls engage, like, you know, the Mm -hmm. activism that you did, the activism that Malala does, um, that's dangerous, right? So how, how can we create a safe space for these girls to exercise their voices and advocate for change in their communities? Um, yeah, for sure. For my, I can ex- say from experience, it's not easy to talk about those things because you're going to get backlashes from those communities, especially when we're talking about, you know, Malala, the Talibani, and we're talking about uh, girls who were displayed because of ISIS and those small communities that basically don't even realize that this is a wrong thing and they don't even realize that they're doing harm by not sending girls to school. So it is very dangerous and it's not easy, even though I talk about it a lot. I'm very vocal about it. Um, I've received a lot of backlash just uh, talking about child marriage specifically, because it's a very common thing that happens in those communities. And it's something that needs to stop immediately. So that's not easy. And the other thing is that a lot of girls don't even realize that what's happening is not right. A lot of them don't Mm. even know it. Um, I'm witness, I mean, even today, I talk to people from back home, they don't even realize that child marriage is the wrong thing. They don't even notice it. So if they don't recognize there's a problem, 
there won't be a solution. And that's why we come in as advocate is trying to talk in family fa- to family, person to a person. That's where that small changes start is by talking to leaders, talking to people who are in charge. I mean, through social media, I'm being very advocate kind of explaining that this is not the right thing to do, just making, bringing awareness. I think that's where the first step is, is uh, bringing awareness that this is that not the right thing. And I think when we start talking about that, there's there's a problem. A lot of people will step up. Yes, there is a problem and we need to solve it. I think that's where the first step is. It's just, it's like I said, it's not easy, especially for other girls who are right now uh, were kidnapped by ISIS and who are coming back. The educational system is not that supportive to get them back into schools. Um, a lot of them became refugees. It's not just easy for them kind of to get back into um, schooling system again. So it's just very, a lot of, um, issues with that but i think we just start about talking about it that's the first step is just be vocal bring awareness that if you see something that's not just just talk about it um and i think there's at some point you're going to receive backlashes it's just it, it's it's going to take time uh, for those people to change their norms uh, but if we don't start talking about it either that's not a solution and many lives would be destroyed i mean every girl that gets married at 12 you're taking somebody out of school you as a mother you need education for that child so we keep coming back to that generation where like generation after generation nothing is changing so the dialogue it starts about bringing awareness going on into these villages going on into these communities saying that this is not the right thing to do and like you said bring in awareness if you have one dollar um it's just better if you split it or even invest in girls education because the benefits are much more uh there are more benefits to that so just yeah. that's where the first step from my experience um you have to do it but um everything you advocate for there's going to be some backlashes especially if you are a member of that community yeah and one thing i want to add to that too is if you are facing backlash or if you're worried about the risk of facing backlash it's important to not do this alone right like find Mm -hmm. a community of other girls education advocates that you can support one another i mean that like for one of the lessons that i teach uh, the youth activists that we work with is when you're first starting out get a friend you know, get someone um, that is equally passionate about the issue as you are, or if they're not passionate yet, make them passionate. You know, one thing that I hear from um, a lot of young folks, like, how did you get involved in activism? Well, I heard an older student talk about how they were so passionate about the, their issue. And that mm-hmm. really motivated me to get, um, to get, uh, in, in, you know, active. And so you don't underestimate the power of your passion, right? Um and um, I'd like to ask you a couple more questions, but I'd also um, love to open it up for the audience. If you, if you guys, wherever you're streaming from, um, comment any questions. We should be able to see that from our end. Um, and so I'd love to ask your questions um, for Nebras or for myself um, and, uh, and have this be more of an interactive event. So um, Nebras, uh, how exactly are you raising awareness about this issue? What, what is the, um, can you give us some updates on what your advocacy is today? Um, so I first I I speak on every single platform that I get the chance um, to talk about my story. I think a story has been a very powerful tool that I have right now to kind of use it to see that girls are still today facing those ill challenges. Even though I was, I'm probably my story is not even close to a lot of others who are like facing a lot of hardships but it's just that bringing using that story to tell the world that there are girls out there there are girls out there who are in need of our help and um so i use every single platform that i get i'm um, advocated a lot with malala fund um uh, mm-hmm. which i by sharing story it's a simple i uh, through assembly they have a tool where it's super simple where you can go in and hear about other girls story it's not just about girls in america or uk or other countries it's every single country and it's available in all languages so that's a way kind of it helped me kind of realize it's just not me there are a lot of girls who are in this together they face challenges more than me um so that's kind of a way for me just uh sharing my story with others and telling other girls it's just going to be fine uh we're going through these challenges but it's a way kind of tell them to not give up um i've been uh, i i went to i give a speech at the un at the 545 drive um uh 
planned by the Irish government to raise awareness about girls' education. And that's where I encourage leaders to invest in girls' education. Um, that's one of the platforms that I've used. Um, so far, I'm working on a project as well to help uh, Iraqi refugees, um, those who have been disabled, uh, from, like, were not able to attend school once coming back or interpretation happened to their schools. I'm trying to help them out with... Uh, going back to school, getting back to, into the educational system and helping out to finish their education because at this point, we need education. I mean, being status of refugee is a, a, it's stopping a lot of people from going to schools and that makes them vulnerable and um, poverty could get them poverty. Um, uh, radical ideas, extreme ideas makes them very vulnerable for that. So that's one of the projects that I've been working on. Um, but otherwise, I just I, every single platform that I get on uh, social media or events that I go to just bring an awareness of uh, girls education and how much uh, girls are out there who need mm -hmm. our help. And basically, because a lot of people don't even know that there are over 130 million girls are out of school today. Um, so this is just something by starting raising awareness about it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, what about uh, other girls in your village? Were you able to kind of get them involved in advocacy, um, you know, uh, kind of follow your path? Not much, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's very, it's it's not easy. Like I said, mm -hmm. um, being, um, it's, I, like I said, the problem is that people don't even realize that it's, not right especially when I speak in terms of child marriage um it's, it's for girls it's very common it's just not the right thing um so that's one of the things that I talk about a lot but like I said these girls don't even realize that um they have like that that's wrong I think a lot of them is just the problem with it is just that we grew up as girls uh, within even families communities we grew up that we are nothing, like we're not going to be anything, even for the future. Um, even if you go to school, then what? That's what I heard a lot um, in those communities. Like, OK, if you go to school, then what? Um, what are you going to be? I mean, you're still going to stay at home. They don't know there's a future out there. They have no idea about that. They've just been raised up about the idea that they belong in the kitchen. So that's all they do is um, from an early age, they go and like leave school, learn household choices and just take care of the family because that's what that's how they've been raised up. They don't even realize that they're just stuck in that bubble. And it's just, it, it's really hard to make them realize that mm -hmm. it, it needs change. But I think with having social media a lot right now and those villages having access to internet, having access to all this technology, I think it's just changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's just being I, that an isolation like that is just going to take a time. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, I start with having a conversation, one-on-one -on -one conversation to saying that, this needs to change. I'm very vocal yeah. about it, even though it's not it's not the most popular thing to do. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, that's that's you know back to that. You know, be vocal when even when you're when you're uh, attacking power, right? Mm -hmm. That is oppressing people. Like it is very very nerve wracking to try to go against that, right? But mm -hmm. um, we need our voices, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of rise up in unison and and combat that. Um, even though it's scary. So back to, yeah, back to the point about solidarity, you know, find, find mm -hmm. solidarity in other people. Um, I want to talk about, so you mentioned awareness raising and mm -hmm. I feel like once there's awareness raising, it re it really should follow immediately. Like, okay, now that you know about the issue, okay, talk to people. That's a great action, right? Like spread awareness. That's, that's like a great call to action, but what else can people do in addition to, to spreading awareness? What do you feel like are some policies that need to be in place or um, perhaps do we need to raise money for girls scholarships? Like, what do you feel like are the, are the other avenues that people can take to actually start changing things in these villages and to actually start facilitating these conversations, these difficult conversations with community leaders and things like mm -hmm. that? I think, like you said, uh, raising awareness, like I said, it's the first step. Uh, definitely, there have got to be a lot of steps that follows that. It's just on um, this community. It's from, I'm, I'm talking about my experience. I'm not very familiar of like how other communities and other countries um, work. But in my specific community, I think that once you realize this is wrong, start start doing a project, organize, give a woman a free space where they can come together and empower one another and talk about it. I think that's one of the things that we lack. And I feel like 
this is something we need, should work more on it. Once you realize that, okay, this is not a right thing to do, we need to change it in terms of child marriage, sending girls to school. Um, they need to get a free space for girls to talk about, to empower one another. Uh, I mean, I'm in the United States, but I think in those villages, we need someone who is in there who can kind of advocate, kind of empower girls, be there if they need it. I mean, a lot of girls in terms of violence, they have no idea or like if they're withdrawn from school, they don't want to be, but they don't know what else to do. I think just having a leader in each kind of community, just kind of a girl could go to them if something happens, if they're prevented from going to school. And I think just starting with school principal, I think it's just that if a girl wanted to withdraw, the school principal is just, and teachers, they it's just a common thing. They was just like, okay, nobody showed up today. I think that's where the need to change is, okay, why are you dropping off? You mm-hmm. like, you're 12. There needs to be some rules in that terms as well. There needs to be a lot of changes in terms of policy. But I like said, in Iraq, you have, there's laws in there. It's just not implanted, especially in those uh, small areas where it's very hard to have access to. It's very hard. They're small um, and era fi- farming villages, basically. So they don't have a lot of resources and any of that. They basically don't know about it even. So just having starting with um, authorities, parents, that's where it start next. I think we just, there's just so many aspects go to it, but I think it's just both aspects. You start with family, you start bringing awareness, you started giving a leader to each girl where they can look up to, um, they can go to if they needed help and assistance and starting as well with like a uh, policy, making uh, uh, school principals not allowing withdrawing girls without any reason or specific reasons um so that's where i think the first two steps should be after that but i like i said creating a platform where they can come together and discuss these issues it's just going to be so empowering for others and uplifting as well great well we're almost out of time so i think now we can take the last couple of minutes and just talk about um you know what what is like for all the Uh, young people that might be watching today what is your final message to them and if you could also share um share where people can find you on social media that would be great as well um and i'll uh also share some last words um so my uh probably a last would be just anybody can be an advocate um it doesn't matter if you experience um the hardship but as girls we need to stand up for others because there are so many girls out there who need our help who are uh who are there's so many hardship through poverty child marriage um and they're forced to do things that including violence a lot of uh other work labor child labor all those kind of things i think it's our time because um like i said it's it's a uh, we're in a privileged place right now to talk about it we have the freedom we have the voice and i think anybody can be the voice for those girls who are out there and i think um anybody if you're interested if you're even passionate a little bit if seeing those girls being dropped out of school for no specific reason or seeing child marriage makes you mad you should start speaking about it you should start finding platforms you can talk about it be vocal about it learn more about it um and i think there's like you said there are so many ways we can start changing but um if you like in those small villages if any of you are watching from other countries just start talking to people you're going to receive a lot of backlash not everything it's not going to be popular from the beginning but that's how it's going to be if if you want to change there's got to be a, there's going to be a lot of backlash but the, at the end the benefits of it are much more so that's my advice for the, all the young people out there and you can find me through my instagram which is at nebras uh um it's just how it's spelled right now in here and i'm also on twitter as well and these are the two uh platforms i usually i'll use a lot of instagram to kind of share stories of girls uh, from other countries and as well in iraq as well so that's amazing. I'll definitely be following you for that mm-hmm. inspiration. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I, and you know, not to repeat too much what Nebra said. I mean, there are tons of resources out there. Um, the Youth Activism Project is one of them. So if you're inspired, please check us out at You Act Project on all social media mm-hmm. or um, YouthActivismProject.org. You can it's, uh, click Get Activated and. Um, and we can have a conversation about how to uplift your activism. And yeah, the last thing maybe I want to say is, you know, there is huge solidarity with with these girls um, that 
you know, are demanding an education, right? And so, um, mm-hmm. and we also in the United States, if you're watching from the United States, we have a lot of issues too. So there's a lot of solidarity, global solidarity, I think there uh, that has to be had for this issue. And um, I'm just hopeful that, you know, we're in a time where student activism is um, more uh, mainstream than ever. So I really think this is a moment, not just for girls' education advocacy, but mm-hmm. all sorts of advocacy to have students rise up. So I want to thank you, Nibras, for your incredible story and for the advocacy that you do. And thanks so much to Jana for having such an amazing event. So. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you both so much for doing this. This was absolutely wonderful. And I loved hearing about both your stories. I think they're both really incredible, although they might be different. And I think we can all use some of the advice you gave us on how to become better youth advocates and activists with each other. So thanks again so, so much.